Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I am Jody Franklin. I am the Communications Director of the Economic Policy Institute. And for several reasons, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dan Greenberg. First, I've known Stan for a very long time, I think since 1989. Uh, second, I had the privilege of working with Stan on Bill Clinton's 1992 presidential campaign. I watched him talk and out talk, cajole, and mold that multi headed monster to victory, which was a pleasure. Third, each and every time I talk with Stan, I walk away from the conversation thinking about whatever we had discussed in a new way. He just gives me something else to think about that I hadn't already, um, which either makes him extremely smart or me not so very. Uh, fourth and most important, he is married to one of my absolutely most favorite people in the world. Um, someone who I would lay you down in front of a moving train for, and who uh, coincidentally is also a really good friend to EPI, uh, Connecticut Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. But Stan has accomplishments in addition to his marriage to Rosa. Stan Greenberg has served as <laughs> polling advisor to presidents and prime ministers, CEOs, and dozens of candidates in the U.S. and around the world, including Al Gore, Tony Blair, Nelson Mandela, as well as national leaders in Israel, Europe, and Latin America. Stan conducts polls for the Israel Project in the U.S., Europe, and the Arab world, as well as the Nobel Prize winning campaign to ban landmines, and for NGOs dealing with climate change, aging, women's advocacy, and political reform. He conducts the bipartisan polls for NPR, the Los Angeles Times, and the Bipartisan Policy Center. Stan with James Carville founded Democracy Corps, the leading organization providing in-depth research and strategic advice to progressive organizations, candidates, and elected officials. When emails arrive from um, what those in the know call DCOR, uh, they get opened right away because the recipients know that there will be something useful and informative within them. Stan is here to talk about his new book with James Carville. It's The Middle Class Stupid. Um, the book is a spirited and serious appeal to the country to put the middle class at the center of our national agenda. And it happens to use a number of EPI charts, which is another reason why we are happy he is speaking here today. Last week, EPI released the electronic version of the State of Working America 12th edition, our 400 plus page, 200 plus chart book. Stan used about maybe 15 charts um, to make his case, and I suspect that many more people will read his book than ours. <laughs> but they both make the same case that income and wealth have been moving to the very richest among us at an increasing rate, and most Americans should care about this because it is this upward movement of income and wealth that is causing low and income families to struggle so mightily. So the plan this morning is that Stan will talk for a bit, take questions, and then sign books. So Stan, welcome. I'm trying to decide where I'd be comfortable, so I'm okay. so I've decided, I've decided to, to stand and wander. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Is the mic on? Yes. Um, okay. Um, and I have, I also have some slide deck, but that's kind of like wallpaper for the uh, for the presentation because you, uh, you have the book and, uh, and and a chance some may have read it already, um, and maybe I'll point you to some things that uh, are important now and relevant now. Um, I, you know, I want to thank Jody for a lifetime of work together, um, as well as EPI. Um, I, you know, I used to you know, read from cover to cover, believe it or not, the state of working America each year just to like to have in my head, you know, that, you know what's happening to America. Um, and you know, Larry Michelle um, is just unbelievable work. And one of the things I did, James and I did, uh, during the course of this, uh, was at the beginning of it because we know we know we know where we were going and we you know we constantly at the you know, at the heart of this was you know a realization that the two of us had you know spent a lifetime obviously radically different we speak differently we look differently um, we have different vocabulary uh, you know we have um, different scale of audience but I. Uh, the, we, this book shipped more on the first day. I'm going to change that. Costco <laughs> sold more copies of this book than all my book, all my eight books <laughs> together. <laughs> so, um, so just, you know, um, it's a different world. Uh, so I, I recommend it. Um, but we, you know, but we, you know, two of us started 
you know, I started, um, you know, and, and known initially for my work on Reagan Democrats and trying to figure out how the Democratic Party, you know, reclaims the working class voters, and that's been my mission. And it doesn't change the problem, the struggle, you know, uh, continues. Uh, and James, you know, started uh, in his work in Louisiana on taxes, and eventually for Governor Casey, uh, where he kind of, you know, honed his both skills in campaign, but also the sense that working people and leaders who understood working people were the ones that had to lead uh, the Democratic Party back to being a majority uh, party. Um, and we both came together, you know, to work together, you know, for Bill Clinton, who ran under the banner of Forgotten Middle Class, um, and that was kind of, you know, like the you know, kind of the, the campaign that, you know, made the clear statement about how we had to change the country, put working people and their values at the center of the country, um, the kind of work that EPI does. Um, and then, you know, as you carry on, as it turns out, decade after decade, um, and then you look back on these charts, when you look at 92, when we didn't know that 1980, you know, when we did 92, and we had a critique of what happened under Reagan, what happened in the decade of the 80s and trickle down. Um, but we didn't know what we know now, that it was a three-decade process. Now, Bill Clinton's presidency made a big difference, an enormous difference on a whole range of, you know, indicators. Uh, but it's almost a blip uh, on the scale of, you know, what we've looked at in terms of uh, what's happened to the country, the changing character of the country, what's happened to the middle class, what's happening to the to inequality, uh, what's happened to um, uh, you know, productivity theft as work is not matched with you know, rising you know, incomes, what's happened to people's families that are a wreck, and increasingly a wreck, and driven above all by what's happening to the working class um, and the middle, of the middle of the country. And so that when we started this, we got together uh, uh, with Larry and Joe. We asked them to say, "Show us what your like your 15 best graphs <laughs> that capture you know what's you know what's going uh, on in the uh, uh, you know in the country." Um, there's a whole chapter of just graphs uh, in which we you know which we just you know, uh, you know, talk about it. Um, and this uh, this book is while well, it is um, it has a lot of data and a lot of you know a lot of polling. Um, you know, information. It's also an exchange between you know James and I, you know, over the over the data, um, over how we reacted to events in contemporaneous terms, you know, in, in real life, and also as we were writing the book, reacting to events, but also reactions to these charts as we're in different hotels and I'm spreading these charts, you know, I'm, I'm printing them out and spreading them across the bed and looking at them all at once and trying to get a you know sense of. The, uh, you know, of, the, of the, you know the country, but just you know the symbolism of, uh, of the fact that you get to that line, which is you know 1980, you know, everybody rises together. It's, I mean, there's nothing you know more powerful than that. Everybody you know, rises together in the post World War II you know, period. Uh, we're all defined. Uh, we all I don't know who we you know, want people to age, but you know James and I, and if you look back on our families and our parents, uh, we're defined by that experience, and it's a presumption. You know, that you rise, we all rise together, hard work is paid off, kids get, you know, an education, and they, you know, they rise in the next generation. Um, and then the story begins in, from 1981, um, in which, you know, and I just, I just put a chart here on marriage, and, this, and the, the, this is marriage rates that has to, the bottom line is essentially the median, um, you know, the median income, and what's happening to marriage rates with the median, median income versus those at the, at the top. Because we at the top have not only have more money, they also have more stability of marriage and a whole range of things that are going, you know, that are take, uh, you know, take, uh, taking place. Um, and I just, on the bottom line, um, this is life expectancy. Um, if you go, you know, from 1972 to 2001 um, and look at the bottom half of the earnings distribution, you know, the uh, that shift is almost no gain. It's a minimal gain. Um, uh, in the life expectancy for those people at the bottom, you know, half, that is the very top, um, there's a massive gain um, in life expectancy. That, so that the totality of what's going on, infusing the country, um, is that the well-being of those at the top um, is advancing enormously, while those in the middle um, are lagging behind. We had almost no gap in life expectancy from, if you look in 2000, um, to the bottom half. Well, if you look at where they were, you know, in 1972, there's barely a gap 
um, in the bottom half, but now is like an enormous gap. Um, and how you go, you know, how you go back, you know, to address these, you know, problem is the, you know, is the, is the challenge. The uh, in this book, I think that there's been a lot of time, you know, the understanding how people experience the crisis, the financial crisis, uh, and the Great Recession, um, and then the lack of recovery um, during that period. Uh, and we've had the good fortune of being funded um, from Democracy Corps, uh, where we've been doing now uh, since uh, one year into the financial crisis, every year. We've been doing in-depth interviews with uh, uh, people, um, as well as focus groups and major surveys and, me and, and message tests. And we began to discover, and this is the real divide uh, in the country and the way they experienced and understood the crisis. For real people, um, as they saw the crisis, they knew and very conscious that before the financial crisis, they thought the, there were deep problems. There was decline in middle-class incomes, there were loss of American, you know, American jobs, the country and themselves and the country going deeper you know, into debt. They also thought this, the, the country was increasingly corrupt. That is, the power that Wall Street and Washington were intertwined in ways that made sure the government reinforced the problems of middle class decline rather than solve them. Uh, and they had a quite deep analysis of the long term problems you know, facing the country. The economic elites, the President of the United States, the Congress, normal people, um, you know, uh, you know, look at the uh, financial crisis and say, we have, a, we have to have a recovery from the crisis. I mean, we even recruit. We've got to, this is a depression, we have to, you know, we have to, we have to lift up the, you know, this economy. We, we have a recovery moving faster. We have to spend in a way that we get up to a different, you know, plateau. It makes total good economic sense. Okay. Except for these voters, what they think is that you're, by talking about the recovery and throwing money at the problem, um, and doing it through the same political system that doesn't look out for ordinary people. I mean, look at the bail, I mean, the, bailouts, the bailouts for them to find economic policy out of Washington and Wall Street. I mean, the bailout of, you know, of Wall Street, the big banks, the bailout of the auto industry, which is, which is very unpopular, and it's still not that popular except in Ohio and Michigan, which may be all that matters. Uh, <laughs> but for them, it defined the way the system worked. You know, it rallied to you know, take care of the people who were the most irresponsible, did nothing about foreclosures, did nothing about the, you know, the major problems you know, facing um, uh, the country. And the further we got down over, you know, away from the, you know, the, you know, the crisis, until the elites began feeling better about the recovery, we were creating jobs, we weren't losing, we weren't losing jobs, there was a positive growth rate compared to, you know, it's great compared to, you know, to Europe. Um, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> Why don't they get that? We need to, when we need to do focus groups, uh, there's two things that we could not break through on. Uh, spending, and the, you know, short-term spending. Why, you know, short-term spending, because they do think that the same people that, are, you know, that do bailouts are going to decide where the spending goes. And they just, and they, and they watch the hundred bill. Which they, you know, which I think is a great, you know, it's, it's extremely important, one of the most important things progressives have done and also need to take ownership of as a chapter of the book on, you know, what we do on healthcare. Uh, but what they watched with healthcare was all the stakeholders, all the special interests, um, you know, getting around the table, you know, each getting their piece of the action. Um, they watch the, the, the special deals, you know, convert, you know uh, cut in the Senate, the, you know, the passive thing. They thought it was like just health care was like part of the same political system that screws the middle class. Um, and so that's, you know, that was, you know, that was, you know, their frame. We would, uh, in focus groups, you know, we would show video of the president going out into the Rose Garden and saying we created 200,000 jobs, or the, or, chief, or the, you know, the head of the Council of Economic Advisors, or National Economic, uh, uh, the Chief Economic Advisor, talking about the number of jobs created, the 4.6 million jobs, or 200,000 jobs, a month, particularly the 200,000, when they were talking positively about this, when they thought that the monthly job numbers would look good. Okay. They almost attacked the moderators in the focus groups. 
okay? Because when you get out there and say, we created 200,000 jobs, what they say, what people say is, they pay minimum wage. There's a, you know, there's a you know, thousand people trying to get every, you know, you know, every job that, you know, that's out there. They don't have, you know, they have, you know, benefits. And as the data, the real data began coming in, you began to see that the new jobs, in fact, created post the crisis, 20% less. We have an abrupt change. The jobs that people get after being unemployed pay 20% less than the jobs that they had before. We know they lost 40% of their wealth um, from before. And if, you, and if you go right now into Ohio and talk to people about how the economy is going, they are still living with this unbelievable wreckage of people having, uh, you know, either they've moved in with parents or kids have moved in with, you know, with them, moved back in with a ex because as a white kid, they could have afforded it, changed jobs, you know, tried to change jobs because they can't afford, you know, the gas. They have an overhang of, you know, debt. You know, from this, they are still living in the middle of this thing. Plus, they see these long-term problems. And so, when the biggest problem that President Obama had was trying to convince people that this election, that, that judge, we should judge him based on his performance on handling the recovery. And there was a long period here, a painful, at least two-year period. Um, the 2010 election was disastrous, in part, because the president kept going out and saying, he says, you know, we, you know, he kept using the metaphor that they drove the car into the ditch. You know, they, you know, we, you know, we are now, you know, trying to bring it out of the ditch. They're just, they're, you know, they're there above, the, you, know, you know, with the, the shovels, the dirt on top of this, making it, you know, harder. We finally got it up to a level field, and we're starting to move this car up the, you know, the hill in the right direction. Okay. God, do they hate that. I mean, they're in the ditch, and they don't, I mean, they don't fully know what they think. Um, and also, they don't think you're dealing with the long-term problems. They don't think you're dealing with the serious stuff. You are dealing with the pace of recovery. And I even got nervous at the Democrat convention that the, you know, except for the president's speech, that the, that they were mainly making the case, give them more time. Understandable, they're not going to do it. But there's nothing on the table that addresses the long-term problem. The only thing on the head is, look, you know, and I see the job bill. I know the job bill is a good thing. You can't probably support it and all that. But the job bill was nothing. I mean, in terms of the scale of the problem we're, you know, talking about. Uh, the, and that's what they're looking for. So, they're, you know, they're, they're against throwing money short-term to try to you know, build schools, you know, in a hurry across the country. Um, but if you say you have a, you have a five-year or ten-year, you know, Two trillion dollar infrastructure plan. They say that overwhelmingly. Okay? They want you to do long term stuff. You know that doesn't look like it's going, you know, going through a, the political process that with this money throwing money and not you know that's just trying to stimulate. That whole language of it, you know, is inconsistent with I think a much you know bigger sense that people have. You know where the uh, the country's going. So. We, and we, you know, we, we talk through here our coming to understand how people look at the economy um, and are looking for, you know, for long-term you know, um, you know, uh, solutions in this. And the, the, the big conclusion that we drew for ourselves, which we didn't have in advance, <laughs> um, was once we got through the data that we used to move around what's happening to the country and the pain of that, and you know, appreciation for how much they understand the long-term problem and how much they're demanding leaders that face up to the problems. Our single conclusion, James you know, tends to get to a simple conclusion, is that we're going to talk about nothing else. We're going to talk about nothing about what's happening to the middle class. That's the only thing that's important. These other people are talking about the deficit system, you know, the white country way down by deficit. There's other people who think there are other you know, problems that are central to the country. Okay. You cannot look at the country, you cannot read this book without saying there's nothing that matters here other than how is there a future for the middle class. That's got to be the central problem. It goes back to, it goes back to 92, and it has to do with what campaigns do. You know, campaigns define what the fight's about, and when, they, when they're successful in defining what the fight's about, they also impact, you know, the, what gets fought out in the election in a way that it advantages them usually, but it also creates the mandate uh, when the election is done. So in 92, we ran on its economy, stupid. You know, Bill Clinton, when he did his first uh, judge session, st stated a union address. 
you know, went and said, I'm not going to talk about the State of the Union. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about only one thing, my economic plans. You know, he ran on the economy. I'm going to put out my, my economic plan. That's what we're going to focus on you know, passing. And I think it probably had a you know, very beneficial effect for that decade. The question is, can we have an election that's about the future of the middle class? What's, you know, what's, you know, what's happened you know, in this? Uh, you know, I put this up because we, this, this is the, the jobs number, the monthly jobs number. Uh, we, have it, uh, we have it in the book. We also test it in groups and people throw tomatoes at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we tested the, you know, we tested the ad, the president, when he started his campaign uh, in Ohio, put up an ad, you know, with that chart. Okay? I can't tell you how low the rating was. It actually was almost the point of the breaking point with the Obama campaign. We were going to release the memo <coughs> saying uh, how voters reacted um, to the ad in this, uh, in this chart. Because they think, if you, if you think this is, you know, Congress, and you know, it means you don't get, you don't understand what's happening to the jobs and the restructuring, you know, of the economy. Um, and, uh, you know, and this is just some of the diameter uh, reactions to the, what happens when the president talks about progress, you know, economic progress. The voters just, you know, are gone. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, when, and when we do, yeah, right now, open-ended tests and say what's happening in your, what's happening in your, how are things with you? Um, not about the economy. It's just everything, virtually, something about health, but everything goes to money and affordability, having enough money to pay for things. People the grocery stores become like this, are consumed with the choices I have to make to get through when they shop at a grocery store. Because people are changing their, their behavior in grocery stores and to deal with this ongoing, which is not changing. Incomes are still falling right now. August dropped 0.8% in their terms. I mean, income is going down right now. Um, and that's the challenge of making an economic in a presidential election when you have this kind of, you know, you know, uh, you know, of, you know of pain. Um, and when we, uh, and we have to recognize that when people look at the problems, this is, I just put this here because we asked this last month uh, in a poll uh, on whether, uh, what economic problems to address. You know, jobs is the top, but government, you know, debt and deficits, you know, almost as big. You know, well, that's one of the, I, I argue that people, you know, people who look at Greece, um, they look at Europe, they look at, you know, they look at California, they think, and we pulled on it, they think when you have debt, that one will be for the country uh, long term, two, you're gonna, it's going to lead to um, uh, not keeping your commitments on pensions, in this case, Social Security. That means that you're going to have, have layoffs, but they think the consequence of debt, they had their own, you know, it's through their own personal fear of private debt, but they also had both countries and states that in fact respond to having big debts with, uh, you know, actions that they are, it's not, they don't, they don't favor, you know, the going to the, you know, entitlement reform is way to address it. I mean, they, they really want to address it is raise taxes on the wealthy and get rid of, you know, special interest banks for oil companies. I mean, they're, they're for a progressive solution to the problem, but they think it's a problem. You know, and if you don't recognize it in some way, you know, into you don't have to do with it. Um, and then you get income wealth and uh, uh, inequality. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on the uh, data, but I'll put this up here because the I'll read the piece because this is the president um, from the convention, um, and which we tested and it tested very well. But just just so you get a sense that the president has moved to this place um, where we're talking about. The recovery from the crisis of 2008 has always been the first and most urgent order of business, but it's not enough. Our economy won't be truly healthy until we reverse that much longer and more profound erosion of middle class jobs and middle class incomes. What makes our economy weak is when fewer and fewer people can afford to buy the goods and services our businesses sell. Businesses don't have customers if folks are having such a hard time. Uh, what drives us down is an economy when there is an ever widening gap between a few folks who live extraordinarily well and a growing number of people, and no matter how hard they work and barely make ends meet. Okay, that's, that's, from, the, that's from the convention. So that the president is in a, is in a frame of saying the problem is but we're going to recover, that's fine, but what's serious is, and, and if you look at what he says in the speech about voting for him, he says, don't vote for me because of what I do in recovery. He says, vote for me because what we're going to do to bring back America as a country of middle class can, can thrive. 
and people aspire to be in the middle class can thrive. So that the, the president's moved to a position where we're addressing the right problem. Okay, so middle class stupid is on my, right there for, uh, for my, for my ego, I'll go back. Um, <laughs> um, just, for, you know, just for those who are active to mention in Charlotte, um, they did paper the whole hall with middle class first, and so we, we viewed this as kind of a, a personal success <laughs> in getting the, uh, the country focused on the, you know, on the, you know, on the main, uh, the main crop. Uh, let me close with, because uh, uh, we have a lot, a lot of policy. You know, because if, if you go back to the filter, for us, the filter of our politics and the filter of our policy is middle class. Uh, and and the, the deal is real clear that, the, that when you send your message in the context of middle class and, and it's focused on the future and it's focused on long term, it's the best political outcome. Our message dominates theirs. And when it's big class, the Republican convention, it's pretty amazing, the Republican convention saying, all right, what this election is about is your disappointment with the last four years. They didn't, you know, they didn't deliver the jobs that, on the hope that they promised. Um, we have how many months of, you know, for an unemployment above 8%, you know, it's okay to fire. Okay. So it's a vote, it's a vote now based on performance over the last four years. The president, certainly, and the whole last day was about Vote future, vote. You know who's going to matter. Who's going to under which you know, under which of these candidates is the future going to be better? Which one is going to make the right choices for the middle class going forward? So it's a future argument. Now, if you've watched, it's poll settled out. Obama moved in uh, with a bigger lead, um, and the Romney people moved into this uh, into a position of uh, we're going to now talk about the the future rather than just the past. If you look at the ads right now in Washington D.C. area. In Virginia, uh, the Romney ad is an economic ad on what he's going to do in the future. But they made a turn. That's pretty effective ad, I guess. So they, so they, you know, so they moved into you know, that debate. So what we said is first we need a politics, the centers in the middle class. That's the, that is our best place to wage this battle, to have an election with the best result. Um, but we also said it's the, best it's the best politics in order to get the best policy. So that, you know, if you focus on the middle class, and I use this filter, or I use healthcare as a filter. Uh, if, you have, if, you, if, you, if you think the main problem of the country is the federal deficit, and since we have rising healthcare costs, and since high, uh, the government continuing to pay in more and more for healthcare, that it makes sense to take action which reduce the amount that the federal government spends on healthcare, and it's okay to move that, on to seniors, which is what you know, by all of the premiums for all of the you know, all of the changes that they propose and make here, all of that is about locking in the spending levels, you know, at inflation, essentially at inflation, at close to inflation for general inflation, not healthcare inflation. And so it's a systematic year-on-year -year cut in healthcare spending for the federal government, adjusting the deficit, but it's shifting those costs to seniors. Maybe they think that. In a competitive market, as a structure, it will be, you know, costs will go down, but why would we think that? Uh, so they shift it. It's okay to shift those costs. But if you think the main problem is what's happening to the middle class, that's the main problem facing the country, then you, it's, it's unthinkable. It's absurd. You have to address health care costs. You know, that's the problem. You know, is rising health care costs. And that's, you know, there's no, it's a, it's a national crisis, uh, is health care costs. Um, and that affects the middle class and you know, what they make uh, and real income. And it also you know, affects the, you know, the ability to sustain um, federal health care pr uh, programs, which are you know, central to middle class life and retirement. Um, and we go, you know, we, in the book, we, we essentially say, you know, and we tried progressives, because I have lots of clients uh, who wanted single payers <laughs> or you know, who wanted Medicare for all. And I said, this is what 15 percent of the economy, or, you know, is about, and we know we know the rate of, of inflation up until this year. The rate of inflation for you know healthcare, you know, and how how much a killer that is for people. Okay, this is going to roll out 2014, and it's going to roll right after that. There is no more important progressive project than making the healthcare reform work. Um, because it's it, and we own it. <laughs> and there are things within it. There are, you know, there are fairly there are things that did not happen in the bill because of special interest lobbying 
that would be the first thing to do to address. Go back, put in, you know, get back public option into it. We, we, all, we went through with the politics of it. We went through with people who were involved in the writing of it. What got knocked out that would have affected cost? That would get it put back in, you know, with you know, Berger. and public options are the most important, but they're you know, but they're you know, others. Actually, not even the most important in terms of cost. You know, if you're looking through for service, or a number, it was probably the you know, biggest thing that you know affected you know, uh, you know, cost. But we go further, and and this was a real challenge, and I challenged all our union friends on this. Employee-based healthcare is failing. Um, we have one of, this is, you know, one of the graphs on here on, the, on high school graduates and the percentage of them that get jobs with health care. It's 20% uh, get jobs with health care. How, how can we carry on, if you say you work, represent working people, you know, carry on with a system in which people, the overwhelming majority, don't get jobs with health care? So we have, we, have, we have to make the health exchanges. My, my view is we have to take, make the most of the individual uh, mandate. Um, and I would move away from employee-based health care to individual uh, base, but that requires much more money in the system. Um, it requires a high minimum wage because employers will shift it for those who provide it. You know, we don't trust we don't, we don't trust them to raise you know, people's wages to compensate for the fact that they are now covering their health insurance themselves. So we, um, we dedicate the financial transaction tax to pay for the subsidy. There's a much bigger um, subsidy being paid out by the federal government um, as people are getting their, uh, their health on exchanges. That states compete amongst themselves to you know, uh, to get you know, uh, to get costs down and uh, universality. Um, but the uh, it's, that's the hardest thing, and, we get it, and we, if people read it to the end of the healthcare chapter, uh, we're way out there. <laughs> and because we got to be, if, if it's, you got to say what, what has to happen here. We're failing, and we have employee-based healthcare is failing. And so we're happy, and we have a, an evolving system. So you know, let's make it, you know, let's you know, make it uh, work. Um, let me, um, let me talk about that. Uh, we um, uh, we just put out obviously get a copy of these uh, graphs. We just put out a copy of um, of, a, of pointers for economists <laughs> on, on talking about the economy and the, and the, and the current economy and, and dealing with the long term problems, the structural problems, and what kinds of, what kinds of investment arguments and growth arguments we, uh, to make in this uh, period. But it's all grounded in the framework of uh, you know of uh, um, of, you know, of this book. Um, this book was, you know, came out, uh, it was amazingly published within like two and a half months of finishing the writing. <laughs> um, and so the, pretty up to date, you know, on the day we have some slide deck that you know, updates you know, some of the tests of the economic, you know, uh, you know, messages. We're in a you know, position to, um, to do well because the president has changed. Let me pause at the end with that. We're in a position to do well in this election, I think, as the president has um, moved. Had he stayed where he was, trying to convince people that the recovery will move in the right direction? Right now, 60% of the country thinks we're on the wrong track, economically. Whatever the overall improvements are, we have a monthly track, monthly, you know, personal economic metrics. Yeah, they're still going down. Okay, so the thing that makes the election hard is people are in pain. You know, they want hope. They want to think things to be better. Um, I think they're making a decision that Romney doesn't get them, you know, there. Um, but there's, that still nags, you know, at this, you know, decision, like what's happening on the, you know, um, economy. Um, and had the president run on, you know, let us finish the job or move in the right direction, um, and no bigger agenda for the long term, I think, I think Romney would have won. Uh, I think we're in a position to win. The issue is, and our challenge is, can we make it big enough on the middle class and the policy option big enough that they can really address the problem? Because it's not clear to me that we have on the table, other than healthcare, you know, policies that um, can advance the ball. But we're not really addressing the inequality and the declining income and the corruption of the democratic process. There are big things that you know, need to be addressed, and the more we push it to that, the better chance we actually have of uh, doing it come January on the long term. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions.
Stan, thank you very much. We're going to move into a little further conversation to get into some of the issues of the book. Uh, there's one question before I take questions from the audience that I'd like to uh, ask you because it's a, a major feature of the book where you and James talk about education and your own educational experiences and kind of how you value, your families valued it. But uh, there was one line, and I think it was yours, where you said, you know, the cost of education continues to go up and the value of education continues to decline at some point soon, we may be facing the point where it's no longer worth it for people to get college degrees, for example. So can you just talk a little bit more about what you think that does to the middle class ethic and really how people view the American dream? Uh, it was James who said that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes the editor, you know, you can usually tell when it's, you know, uh, um, when they got it wrong. It's not worth it. Um, but it, it was James who said, who said that and was struck by that. I'm, I'm actually struck by how amazingly non-rational and non-calculating people are about the education stuff. Because I'll describe this focus group where people where things are a wreck. And they are, you know, a, a significant number of them. Uh, particularly women, a significant number of them are off getting training or in community colleges or trying to find something. They're looking for somebody to give them advice on what's the real, what, what, what does it make sense to do. I, mean, it's, uh, I do this in Europe. I call for the Labour Party in, um, in Britain. Um, and I work in Israel and other, and other places. But I, can do, but I do groups you know, in Britain um, now. Um, and there, it's, uh, we have higher unemployment, unemployment rising now. Uh, people are totally inert. There's not, there's not this sense of, you know, this can be better. There, there's these structural forces um, that, you know, that are there. There's a larger kind of political change that will affect it. And then, so they're more, they're more politicized. But here, people are have, they're into personal strategies, you know, and they will, and I think they will they react to an econ a, a debate on education. There's actually, Almost nothing. In our tests, you know, this month we tested the, the uh, different mess economic messages of the president. The education one was the strongest. Both the critique of their cuts, their 20% cuts, because people, this is the only strategy they got. <laughs> you know, they, so they're not. I don't. I think at all levels, you know, whether you know, full college and more expensive colleges to community college, people think this this, this is the only way. It's the only thing we got. And so everybody's still invested in it, and so so we have an obligation to get the you know the cost under control and the affordability. And our and our language on it politically is not that great. I mean, the president talks about how much the Pell Grant changes have made a difference, and it's true, but it's really hard when it's being overwhelmed by the uh, the inflation of you know college costs to say you know. Things are better. And if you want to you know, identify what, you know, the two groups that are most problematic in this election, it's young people, in terms of level of support and willingness to vote, um, and white working class voters are one of the two, you know, the two groups that right now are performing significantly worse in 2008. Um, and, but education is a piece of it, but they want it to happen. So it's, Romney kind of is like, I mean, they're, uh, you know, I expect disengagement, you know, in some ways more than you know, going to Romney, I mean, there's no increase in number of people call themselves Republican. You know, like this foreign entity that doesn't believe in climate change, doesn't believe, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, there's so many issues in which they are, you know, off, you know, disqualifying. Uh, but it doesn't, but it doesn't necessarily produce votes for us. And there's certainly not a lot of conf confidence that we have a strategy or no have a plan or, you know, no, they really want to know what's the plan. And if education, and if you list the pieces that they want in the plan, the education is the number one. Okay. A little questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, whenever I, I whenever I uh, go to real clear politics to look at their compilation of polls, mm -hmm. I'm always struck by the fact that there's one poll that is different. From all the others, I mean, you, there are two groups. There's Rasmussen, right. which only shows, or usually only shows, Romney with a small lead, and all the others show Obama with a lead. And it's the same thing in the Senate races, by the way. The right. Republican always comes out better in Rasmussen than a Democratic candidate in all of those other races. Mm. So what is it about, what's Rasmussen doing? Is he standing <laughs> differently? Is he constructing his questions mm. to get a particular response? What is it about? 
Um, I know one of the explanations, uh, the, um, but there's, pro there's probably others. I, and we do know, you know, that you know after the you know the last election, there was an evaluation of the you know the polls, and Massachusetts was consistently you know, two point. You know, there's a moving average of all the polls is consistently two points more Republican. Um, than, all, than, than the moving average. So it's a, you know, some polls have, you know, fluctuations. They go, you know, above and below. If they're bad methodology, but it's not a biased methodology, it'll, you know, it'll, like, small sample. It'll just fluctuate a lot on both sides of this moving average. That's reason is always on the same side. The biggest thing is, uh, is that it is, it is a auto dial uh, in a poll. And so it's, uh, which means legally there can be no supplements. Um, and right now our polls, like our national polls, are one third uh, supplement. Um, and so it's, it's more expensive to do it, but their, their methodology doesn't allow them to do it legally. Um, and so they and, the, and there's no compensation for it. I suspect the other piece uh, is race, and that's Gallup. By the way, Gallup is also consistently off. Um, because they have, they have refused to uh, make a judgment about what proportion of the electorate will be minority uh, in this election. And now, no pollster would do that. <laughs> because we know uh, we have exit polls, we have the you know we have the census you know uh, that does a, uh, a survey right after the election. We, you know we know what the racial composition of the 2008 electorate is. We know the population trends. Uh, we know that the minority portion has never gone down. Okay, it's like it's growing. <laughs> it's um, so it's so we have um, in, we have kept it the same. It was you know so it was twenty you know six percent in the in the last uh, poll, uh, the last election, two thousand eight. Uh, we've kept it there because we thought the African American vote would not be as, as high uh, as it was, but we may be wrong. Um, there are others have the twenty eight percent because of the Hispanic vote, you know, whereas then it may be that African American voters protect you know Obama, and so it'll be twenty six to twenty eight. Okay. So Gallup has it at 24. If you look at the, they, they say they'll set a quota. So they will allow just the sample to come in. Their number is actually 24. So they're making, the Gallup is making the assumption that the minority portion will be lower in this election than it was uh, in 2008. And no one else believes that. I mean, I do a lot. I do a lot of bipartisan polls for NPR and for, you know, the LA Times. Uh, and, you know, we have to agree on what the racial projection is and we have the same we have the same racial projection so that so that's why Gallup is systematically more favorable to the uh, to Romney. You're saying Rasmussen does auto dial? Yes so and therefore no cells. And so what is the consequence of doing auto dial in terms of the results that they get? Do they get less completed data? So it is less. So um, yeah, it's, it's actually better than you would think. <laughs> the, um, you know the things you can do if you you know if you know, they actually don't, you know, don't want to do quotas that would, you know, ensure, you know, like minority, that would ensure things that would, you know, give you a more representative. Um, it's, there are lots of problems, you know, in terms of seniors, seniors lost the room to do it. I mean, lots of problems with it. They have to offset. So they're, they're, they're weird. And you should not believe any of their state polls. Uh, but, you know, by the way, you know, Nate Silver did a thing just looking, comparing the polls that have cell phones and not. The average lead for Obama um, for uh, for non-cell uh, is 2.9. The average lead with cell is 4.1. So you know, so Obama's probably you know. Okay, could you just talk a little bit about cell phones and representative samples and why they're important? Well, just, you know, just and particularly young people and me. <laughs> you know, I don't answer my you know house phone ever. <laughs> the, uh, the um, two things. One, one you have to. You, that's where people are, and so you have to reach them. Uh, there's just that m more and more people that are either you know, you know, fifty fifty on cell or cell phone only. I think mean, the cell phone only may be pushing toward twenty percent. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's moving at an unbelievable rate. Now, on the other hand, it's also saved us <laughs> because the our completion rate is higher. Uh, with you know with cell phone because we it's it's, it's not as cluttered um, you know it's you know with cell you know with cell phone um, than it is uh, with because uh, we can do it because we're not you know uh, we're not we're not it's a human it's a human the law doesn't allow you to do auto stuff 
um, the result is you don't, you know, you don't get all the, you know, all the charitable appeals and lots of, you know, lots of things. So it's pretty uncluttered. Now we also, you know, able to pull, we used to pull only from like Sunday, start Sunday, that's when most people are at home. You know, so you, so you would start Sunday and you like call it a three nights, right? Now you, you have to, you start your cell on Saturday morning and go through the weekend on cell because people are more willing to do a cell phone interview. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not at work, they'd rather do it. You know, so it's changing when we call, but we're actually the polls are probably a little better now. You know, more, a little more representative because, you know, because of the cost of cells. Stan, do you have an opinion as to why Rasmussen, I mean, clearly they probably know this information as well, but why would they not opt to, to do something that they I don't understand, I mean, the New York Times has a thing, you know, where if, so they adjust it, so they, you know, so they sort of put like, you know, has a formula in which he puts, he, he weights it up so, so that it, you know, corrects the problem. For the purposes. Um, and they, you know, they check which times pass the standard, and so it does not have the check and it meets the standard. I don't understand why it's in the average. You know, I try to I try to persuade them. It's so clearly biased and structured to be biased that it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the average and shouldn't be published. Um, in those that are monitoring the public polls, we have an average which we leave out the rest. You know, but, but. Right. in the back, Mr. Harrison. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm not this church, and we are part of a coalition called Faith and Politics. Not faithful, but faithful, but... I know faithful politics. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is the coalition of uh, Christians and the Muslims. And a lot of things that we talk about are low mm -hmm. And when I hear this, I ask, well, where are poor people in this? And are you considered poor people as part of the middle class? Or more or more? And I noticed that politicians mm -hmm. don't like talking. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of the book, by the way. Not that I'm on commission or anything, but it's also a big part of the book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we do address it. Uh, the, you know, there's a chapter in which we talk about who's, you know, who's middle class. In terms of, you know, what's, what's our definition? You know, you know, and we, you, know you, you can't get done with the chapter without saying everybody's in. Everybody's in. Anybody who you know, wants to work, who's working, wants to work, you know, who's in our middle class. Because we start with, like, you know, and we also, we, in the end, we believe it's, it's not defined by income it, um, or by self-identity. It's defined by values. And aspiration is the way we, you know, define it. Um, but we do do the, uh, the exercise. Uh, first of all, let's go, you know, let's go by income. You know, we end up with probably 25,000, 25 to 125 is probably the range that, you know, that we include, you know, you know, you know, you know, in our income range. You know, Bob has under, you know, under, you know, under, you know, under two, you know, 250. You know, we go to this and we say, we read an article in the New York Times about the servant the workers and working in the, in the food industry and the hotel industry in New York. And, and one of them has off benefits and they get, you know, just barely minimum, you know, minimum wage, you know, you know, without, you know, no benefits, multiple jobs, clearly and fall into poverty, you know, level. You know, we say, why aren't they middle class? <laughs> you know, they you know, on our standards, they're just fine with us. And we have, so we have, you know, we have a, you know, we have a inclusive view of it, and we always say middle class, and people aspire to be middle class. And so it's people who believe in hard work and who believe in education, you know, should, you know, move, move up each generation. It's kind of the central, you know, piece of it. I'll go a little further than the book, you know, because um, we did a study uh, in which we had the president saying in his message, we had to do his message, of some phrases that said, you know, I'm sad about the, the Ryan budget and what it does, uh, but particularly what it does to the most vulnerable. Just the first little phrase, the most vulnerable, you know, you know to it. Uh, and we, we included in the critique, we had all the, you know, the, the cuts, 20% cut in education, the Medicare, 6,000 transfer, of costs to seniors. And then we added um, raises taxes on the working poor, pushing two million children uh, into poverty. That was like about the highest of the critiques of the Ryan budget. Now, I've been trying to make the case, and then we look, we showed what moved. What moved were unmarried women. Where they want, you know, the uh, this is a changing country. The majority of country, majority of births are minority. No, um, a majority of families are on. Are unmarried. <laughs> in fact, we have unmarried in a country that's increasingly unmarried. Okay. Unmarried women could be a quarter of the electorate. 
Okay, they are heavily democratic in their voting. Turnout's the big issue. Um, but they are, you know, one quarter of the electorate are probably uh, close to half of the, the vote of Democrats. I mean, is you know. so I'm not giving them like a critical piece. Right? They have really, they have really hit hard. They are they're much less income. They're much more vulnerable, you know, into what's happened in this economy. They don't have the security of having a second person, you know, bringing in, you know, uh, money. Frequently, have kids. Um, and are really, uh, really hit hard by this crisis. In fact, when they, the data came out initially on the, on the, that the first job losses were male, but it turned out if you broke out women separately, married or unmarried, that married women didn't, you know, it was late into the process before they began facing, you know, uh, the effect of the recession. But unmarried women, like, at, at the right at the beginning and just as bad as men. So they were hit hard, they're big Obama supporters, um, hit hard by this economy, really struggling to come back, um, been late, you know, coming back on vote, and anyway. So what we found is when you, the president says, you know, I care about how this affects the most vulnerable, unmarried women, like, well, they have shifted like 10 points in this exercise. Okay, they, you know, they, you know, they, they, they know they're vulnerable. Um, and I think the, what Romney has done on the 47 million, um, I think sets up an argument. I'm about to push back and say, let's remember here, our coalition here is, is you know, wants to be recognized on how much they're on the edge. Um, and so recognizing the poor, recognizing the vulnerable, I think sh should be part of what we do. Mr. Paul, that's the wrong answer. The, the, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Paul, okay, we're on the um, uh, fiscal issues here at, uh, at EPI, and um, one one thing that I was interested in was because uh, um, you know, I do a lot of budget stuff was kind of you know, your your point that on the one hand um, voters really do um, respond to this notion that we are going to spend you know two trillion or something like that over five years and you know this very large public investment. On the, um, and on the other hand, they really don't like spending, which of course is you know contradictory. Um, I, the, one of the difficulties that I kind of have is, again, making that connection, trying to take like budget issues and try to make them, um, I guess, applicable for kind of the middle class. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that the, you know, the Obama campaign had kind of tried to do this with uh, uh, the Life of Julia infographic. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw that or not, but it shows kind of at each stage in someone's life, you know, how budget decisions actually impact mm -hmm. them. So I'm wondering what you thought about that and what, you know, some of the ideas you have about taking the budget debates and actually mm -hmm. um, making them relevant to the middle class. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, the, uh, in the book, there's a uh, chart. This is this is actually updated. We've been, we keep revising the, the list of economic problems you want the country to face. So we have, you know, we have this basic chart here. But you, what you see, they're saying, what's the problems to address? We have high government spending and budget deficits, um, and high taxes and government regulation, like the top two together, and one third. You know, of the responses, they can get two responses, but there's you know one third of the responses. But there's no doubt. You know, just when people are looking at the long-term problems facing the country, debt and spending and debt is like serious for them. So we got We have to have that. You're recognizing it, and, and I, I will talk about it. And then we have, you know, lack of jobs, and which is split evenly. You know, between lack of new industries that create jobs and and China, and China you know, and trade practices, you know, uh, impacting jobs. And then we have the climbing middle class incomes, and then we have the corruption, you know, of Wall Street. Um, so there was kind of a measure of the scale of it, but you know, the people don't think you're serious. If you don't have debt as part of what you're doing, you know, they think you're not serious about the long-term problems. And so they're probably the least for a while look like they're serious because at least they want to cut spending. You know, they said you know, there's one problem they want to address, not enough. You know, um, so we have struggled with how to do this. And those, you know, you know, in the book I, you know, painfully lay out, you know, how to have a, how to, how often I lost this. I even have a back and forth with a partially fictitious, not totally, uh, the campaign for America's each way to fire me because I couldn't win the argument, you know, on austerity. Uh, that was still the winning argument. I, the, um, I, the, um, I, I, the metrics I track right now, um, um, on uh, this is on spending on, on austerity that we asked this month, you know, which were you know we're asking you know, drastic cuts in sp government spending will weaken the economy and cost jobs, means more layoffs and lost tax revenue that makes the deficit worse. 
I mean, that's true. We're watching Britain, that's exactly what's happening. Or, the only way to restore prosperity and market confidence is dramatically reduce government spending and long-term deficit. We lose two to one. This is like now. This is a poll that we just did. <laughs> okay. We haven't begun <laughs> to win this, you know, win this, you know, um, argument. Now, what, however, what we have found is that, and it's an experimental exercise, <laughs> that when we make the argument um, that the Krugman argument that uh, it's actually going to make it you know, worse and we have to have this funding and be a, a, a burst in um, um, uh, an investment. It actually, even though it doesn't score well, when we test at the end on whether we're winning the overall economic argument or even and the political debate, it has a significant impact. In fact, more impact than any other message. So that while we are losing when they listen to us, we have to make the argument <laughs> on why you know a contraction of the economy by drastic you know cuts you know um, um, hurts. The strong uh, much more have it here. The strongest message that we tested, it, um, I think I have it here, and uh, um, that says that while you know while we address the debt burden, the most important thing now is investing, building our market strength, and essential advantages of growing the economy in the, uh, in the middle class. You know, our approach to the economy says it will prove stronger, grow, and share prosperity when we start with the middle. Um, but it's, the starting point is that um, you know we will address it. You know, why we will address the debt burden, so we acknowledge it's important. Um, and then I think at the end of the message we tested, you know, it says that we actually will do better in you know reaching the deficit by going for growth. Um, and so it was it was the, one of the most impactful messages we had. So that the there is a way of doing it, and we have to address it. And we have to, and I think we have to be explicit. All that comes to be subtle, don't work. <laughs> but you do have to say you recognize you, know, you get it. You recognize it's important. Um, and you have to say you know, at the end of your message that this message of getting growth will, in, in fact, bring down, you know, bring down the deficits faster. You know, and so it looks like it's part of your goal, but what you're really making the case for. Um, and, uh, and our message, I'm not sure this says it, uh, Um, while we, um, it needs to be an investment that sounds like you're doing your investment something that's long term. So, you know, we should be investing in our infrastructure to modernize the country, we should invest in our energy, that's going to make this energy independent and create jobs. So it, it looks like you're, you know, you're, you know, you're rapid, you know, severe, big, <laughs> large investment is not geared to throw money at it. But it's an investment, it's in things that, you know, that, you know, that, that will make the country stronger. And so we can, you know, we really found we can advance the argument if we get in that context. I'm, I'm dealing with it right now in Britain because we're in the middle of that, you know, debate against, and we're, and the argument's moving in our favor in Britain. Um, uh, but you still have the plurality in Britain who say, despite the contraction, that it may be painful in the short term, you know, but at least it'll, it'll, it'll make things better in the long term. You know, there's now a plurality that says that, but when we started the polling, we had like, you know, two thirds, you know, saying it would be, it's a dramatic drop in people thinking it'll pay in the long term. In Britain, where you've lived with it, um, you know, but this is, this is the central debate. Okay, so we'll go Karen and then Simon over here. Hi, I'm Dr. Carol, I'm Hoplin. I'm a primary care physician. Uh, as of April, I became an attorney. As of April, I became a senior, and I'm originally from Massachusetts. So I have three questions. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how many we get to. All right, I'll get one. They're all short. One of the lawyers, next question, why not? Um, Elizabeth Warren, uh, if what you say is true, Elizabeth Warren should be running away with this in Massachusetts. I mean, she's she a position about, I know the latest poll, <laughs> uh, but it, it was a struggle. And who knows if it will if it will stay. Her position about big banks and all that is unequivocal. Second thing, uh, Medicare and Social Security. Um, seniors who are big, seniors, it's, it's the 